Hey there groovy dudes and dudettes, this is Thomper Be Thompin and in this video I'm going to give you an overview of my 2022 Yamaha Grizzly 700. I'll include lots of video of trail riding, first person, third person. I'll give an overview of a lot of the, uh, the features that I think are important to take note of. I'll just kind of show you how everything works on it. And then I will run through a list, uh, a short list of some of the mods that I've done so far in this machine. So real quick, just for a little bit of context, I am coming from a 2020 Yamaha Kodiak 450 with EPS. I love that machine. I've got a video out about why I am upgrading to the Grizzly, but it basically boils down to I wanted something that could still be reliable and do lots of work, but be a, a lot more playful on the trails. Okay, so the first thing I want to talk about is ergonomics. I'm six foot tall and this machine fits me perfectly with definitely some room to spare. One of the issues I had with the Kodiak 450, the 2020, was that it was ever so slightly cramped. And the only spot it was really cramped is when I was standing and riding and I was a little bit hunched over. So this bike or this quad has uh, taller handlebars which allow you to stand up and ride all day long. I prefer to stand and ride, it's just pretty comfortable to me when I'm going through trails pretty fast. And yeah, there's absolutely no issues. If you're over six feet tall, you'll feel comfortable sitting and standing on this machine. Uh, the solution for the 450s is obviously just to get some bar risers or to get a different handlebar set up with a higher bend. All right, I'm purposefully gonna go slow through here in two wheel drive low then four-wheel drive low, then four-wheel drive lock, and see if I can't trip up the system to make it and have to use lock. The next thing I want to talk about is floorboards, and Yamaha does these really well, but one of the things I noticed on the 2020 Kodiak 450 was that even though the plastic setup was pretty similar to this, uh, it only had a plastic uh, foot, foot peg with uh, plastic teeth right here for you to grip on. So the Grizzly has a metal structure. These teeth are not very sharp at all. I'm sure you can get an aftermarket solution to get a taller, grippier foot peg than that but at least there is some metal there for you to grip on in the mud. Last thing about the floorboards is the overall width. Something that I noticed immediately when riding this one after riding the Kodiak 450 was how wide it is. So from outside plastic edge to outside plastic edge, this one measures 39 inches across and the Kodiak 450 measured 41 and that's only two inches wider 
but I could notice it pretty quickly. So if you're standing up and leaning on the outside corners with your feet, you might notice that narrower width. Next I want to talk about the gear selector and the instrument cluster. So the gear selector is very basic. You've got low, high up at the front, neutral, reverse, and park. I really like having park in the transmission for an ATV. Uh, there is no backup emergency brake on here. Now for the instrument cluster, just turn the key. You get a little startup procedure here. And you've got a lot more info over the Kodiak 450s, the latest models. One thing is you have a gear indicator for every gear you're in. The Kodiak 450 only showed park, reverse, and neutral, not high or low. So if it's in the dark, you can you can just take a real quick glance if you're on and off the ATV quite a bit and see whatever gear you're in. It also has miles per hour, of course. And you have at the bottom here, you've got your clock that you can set. You've got your uh, total hours. You've got your battery voltage and your engine temperature. I really like the engine temperature and that is pretty fast to update too. So you can see when the machine's properly warmed up before taking off. And in the middle line here, you have the overall odometer. You have a trip A and a trip B. And then you also have a uh, wrench uh, with, a, with an hour countdown for next time you need to service the machine. Also on this instrument cluster, you have a high beam notification. And you also have your four-wheel drive, which will pop up right here. So I'm going to select four-wheel drive, and then after I'll, I'll select the, uh, the front differential lock. And you can see here how it displays. So there's four-wheel drive selected. And I switch over and I select diff lock. And you can see there, so it, since I'm not moving and it cannot engage yet, it'll blink until it engages for you. For anyone who doesn't know, you've got your thumb throttle, you've got your front brakes, rear brakes, four-wheel drive selector, diff lock selector, you've got your start button, you have your light switch from off, low beams, and high beams. You also have your uh, engine kill switch and your reverse override button. This, uh, this winch controller is an aftermarket component I'll talk about later. So this next part, almost isn't even worth mentioning but I want to talk about four-wheel drive engagement. The manual for the Grizzly 700 says to come to a complete stop before shifting into four-wheel drive and the manual for the Kodiak 450 which almost certainly has the same components for the four-wheel drive engagement said you can be uh, you can let off the throttle while moving and shift into four-wheel drive. I've done that with this machine plenty of times and it's been perfectly fine. I don't know why the manual says for this one to stop when shifting into four wheel drive. Of course, when you're gonna shift into diff lock, you need to come to a complete stop. Also, when stopping to go between gears, park, reverse, neutral, high and low, of course you come to a complete stop to do that. But this has to be a pretty similar four wheel drive system to, to basic trucks and SUVs with transfer cases and stuff. If you, you, a lot of those, like Jeeps and Forerunners and stuff, you can shift on the fly into four wheel. Again, I've done it with this on absolutely no issues so far.
personally a big fan of having dual brake levers that control the front and rear separately. So on these Grizzly 700s, and I think on all the, the Yamaha ATVs, you've got, at least their utility machines, you've got your rear brakes are controlled by your lever on the left-hand side, and your front brakes are controlled by a lever on the front-hand side. Some of the Can-Ams and Polarises usually just have a single lever on the left-hand side, which will control all the brakes. Of course, you always do have a foot brake that's common on basically every single machine that controls the rears only. But I do prefer a dual lever setup because if you're in some rocky off-camber terrain or you're hopping on and off the machine doing a lot of utility work, you've got a way to stop the machine on each side of it without having to reach over if the bars are really far away. And last comment on the brakes is that this machine does have hydraulic disc brakes at all four corners. So you got two discs in the front and two discs in the rear. Uh, disc brakes up front is pretty popular, but having discs in the rear isn't always the, uh, the preferred choice for manufacturers. For example, the Kodiak 700 has a wet disc brake here in the rear, which is uh, fully sealed and usually lasts the lifetime of the machine. It doesn't provide the same type of braking power, but the advantage with those is that if you do sink the machine deep into some mud, that brake is always gonna be available. All you have to do is maintain it by keeping the fluid fresh and doing regular changes for that. But the discs in the rear provide way better stopping power in my experience. You do have ample storage on these Grizzly 700s. You've got a single compartment up here in the front, which is a screw-on, screw-off cap. That is a basically a dry compartment, from what I hear. Um, I have balled up a, like a windbreaker, and I've been able to stuff that and fit that inside. So that's a good compartment for phones and keys and things like that. You've also got this compartment up front, which is like semi-dry, like water-resistant. This one's pretty substantial in size. You can easily fit a hoodie, a jacket, several pairs of gloves, you know, maybe a toe strap or two, but this compartment does get pretty warm. And lastly, in the rear, this one is definitely not waterproof or dustproof. There's a big gap right here that can let all that stuff in, but it's pretty secure. I've got a 20 foot rope. I've got a 15 foot strap and a few soft shackles and room to spare. That's a pretty big compartment. Great place to keep things like toe straps. Battery access for these machines is very straightforward. You've got this black plastic piece that just pops on and off with little plungers and it slides off. So you've got quick access to your battery right here. This is where I mounted my winch contactor, which I'll go over later. Um, but yeah, great little spot to access your battery, your fuses in a split second. All right, we've got to take a few seconds and discuss the color right, right quick, right? So this is, I'm calling it highlighter yellow and gray. And I first saw this on the internet and oh my gosh, no way. But it's honestly grown on me and I'm not just saying that. I do like it a lot and it does look a lot better in person. The gray is primo. You've got a lot of gloss gray in the back and then a lot of matte gray up here where your legs touch. And up front, very similar situation. You've got this kind of like matte yellow green and a lot of the uh, gloss yellow up front. I like it. I painted my aluminum skid plates to match. In front, on the sides, and in the rear. So that just kind of gives it a little extra touch. Uh, those were just bare aluminum before that. More on the skid plates in a bit. So I want to talk about how wide this bad boy is real quick. The Kodiak 700 and Kodiak 450 are only 46 inches wide. 46 is a really common width for a lot of ATVs, especially in like the mid-bore category. 
It's great for trail riding because it gives you a lot of stability and it allows you to fit through a lot of tight trails. So here, East Coast, lots of dense forests. And you know, we got pine forests, deciduous forests, and things like that. So there's a lot of really tight trails. And this thing is two inches wider at 48 inches. You'd think that two inches wider really wouldn't make that much of a difference on the trail, but it is definitely noticeable. So if you are constantly traversing extremely tight trails, or you've got a tree on each side of you all the time, it's definitely something to consider. With that comes a greater turning radius, but honestly, the turning radius isn't really a factor for me in real world driving. So I really like that these ATVs come with two inch hitch receivers. This bracket right here, it bolts up in four spots on the back of the ATV. To me, that is the only way to do a rear end on an ATV. I put this little device from Rugged Ridge in there myself, but so this is a great way to use this machine for utility. And you can also uh, link up any type of recovery point you want on the rear end. Now the front end's a bit of a different story. I don't get why manufacturers don't put more recovery points for these machines. So obviously this winch is aftermarket, these skid plates are aftermarket. Normally you just get a plastic one that looks very similar to this, but there's no recovery point on here. I suppose you could put a rope around this front bumper and give it a tug there, but do you really want to pull from that, especially if you're pulling out of a deep mud hole? I would love to see a secure, strong recovery point that you could hook up a shackle or or some sort of a, a d-ring or a soft shackle something a hook where you could give this thing a proper yank from the front and one of the other things i really like about this machine is the aftermarket support yamaha sells a lot of grizzly 700s it's their flagship atv and so sure you're going to get lots of different aftermarket companies that are going to provide support for this machine so they don't change it very much between model years either which is an, another good thing in my opinion, it's fuel injected, it's liquid cooled, it's got a great four wheel drive system, and it has plenty of power to, to get you anywhere and to have some fun. No, it won't keep up with those Can-Am and Polaris 1000s, but that's not really what this machine's designed for. Another like for me are these traditional metal racks. I'm a big fan of this style of rack. It's just simple metal with like a powder coated, uh, kind of a textured finish on here. Very robust, you can weld things on. I'm sure not a lot of people do that very much, but yeah, you've got great capacities, like 100 pounds in the front, give or take, and something like 198 pounds in the rear. I, I'm a big fan of the metal racks. One more like is the EPS. So these Grizzlies come standard with EPS and every reviewer is gonna comment pretty positively on how well that performs. It's only a single setting, so there's no changing the sensitivity of it, but at slow speed, it works phenomenally. So if you're in tight, off-camber, rocky, bouldery situations, you can steer this thing with one arm with ease. But at high speed, you do get plenty of uh, that, that, that high speed feedback that you'd prefer. So in my opinion, Yamaha really did does the EPS very, very well. Now there's just a couple of dislikes that I wanna briefly mention and please understand that I absolutely love this machine. I would totally buy it over again, no problem. But there's, there's one thing when standing up and uh, driving up a very steep hill, so you're leaning forward very far. I want to be able to push my feet farther back, but I, I wear a size 12 boot, so I don't have the, the smallest feet, but yeah, when you're leaning forward, going up a really steep bank, I wish I was able to push my feet a little bit farther back to grab some more perch back there. But that's, 
that hasn't stopped me from doing anything. Okay, so this next section is gonna be all about modifications. Now I knew there were a few things I was gonna do straight away to this machine. Uh, very similar things that did to the Kodiak 450 that worked out really well. Tires, skid plates, a winch, and hand guards. So I'm gonna run you through those real quick. Purchasing the machine at the dealership, I immediately had them put on these ITP Terracross RTs. This is a great all-terrain tire with a radial construction, and it's uh, a good fit for my needs out here on the East Coast. I don't really do tons of mudding. I basically just like regular trail riding. I'll hit some mud, I'll hit some snow, dirt trails, rocky trails, and I sometimes I like to go fast, and sometimes you like to go slow and rock crawl, but these tires really do it all. It came down to these and the Kenda Bear Claw HTRs. I had those on my 450 and they were exceptional. They are an eight ply rated tire and these are only six plies. But the weight is right about the same. I believe for the 25 inch tall by 10 inch wide on a 12 inch rim tire for the Kenda Bear Claw HTR and these ITP Terracross, they were within about a half of a pound of each other, right around 25 pounds. So these are in the stock size. I'm a true believer in kind of staying stock size. I don't, I don't want to mess with clutching and stuff like that. And this is plenty of uh, ground clearance for me. So I, uh, I went with the 26 inch tall tires. They are, however, a half an inch wider. So with the radial construction and the half inch of additional width front and rear nine nine inches wide in the front 11 inches wide in the rear it is a heavier tire so you know that's more for that transmission and engine to turn so it's going to take a little bit of that snap away but i really do like these for an all-terrain they've got a tried and true tread i know a lot of guys run these they're popular in gncc racing and i have noticed that they appear to have a little bit more sidewall lug than the kenda bear claw hdrs that one kind of, the sidewall went up a little bit farther before the, the lugs really started to get very deep. But so far, happy with these. I don't know how I feel about having a non-directional front though. I think having a directional front tread is definitely better for higher speed, but these have been pretty good so far. a big believer in getting substantial skid plates underneath these there's a couple options you can go with and I recommend doing at least one of them because the stock skid plates that come with these are a complete joke if you do not anticipate driving over any logs or stumps or rocks or running into any surprises like if you're just using it for farming and ranching or something like that driving trails at Hatfield McCoy stay stock save your money save some weight but I got the aluminum set from Ricochet Off-Road. Uh, it covers the entire underbelly from front to back, side to side, every A-arm, and underneath the floorboards. It's a little bit difficult to show with this camera angle. But it's great protection for your boots, front and rear, inside and outside. Your rear diff is completely covered up. I'm just a big believer in aluminum skid plates. They're not cheap. They're not cheap by any means, but install is fairly simple and you just have cheap insurance for the rest of the time that you're going to be using the machine. The next thing I added was a worn VRX 25S winch. I had this, this uh, with synthetic line there. I have the same exact winch 
on uh, the Kodiak 450 and I've been really happy with it. I prefer the synthetic line. I know that you get pros and cons with choosing either wire rope or synthetic line, but this winch is uh, very easy to operate. Um, and I like the, uh, the switch system. So it is wired up. And install was a, pretty much a breeze. I've got a video out about that. Check out that video where I explain how you want to make sure that you order the correct mounting plate because Warren sells one that they say fits this machine, but it doesn't actually fit. I also got this uh, splicer thimble thing from Rocky Mountain. I'm, I'm a believer in closed loop winching when possible. And uh, it's just a lower profile setup up front here. So I did have to unsplice the rope that came with this winch and I had to feed it through this little mechanism and then splice it down into itself afterwards. So that is a pretty easy installation, but it's just a little bit sleeker and you can fit a metal D-ring or a soft shackle in there, no problem. Very happy with the winch. It's been good so far. modification I knew I wanted straight away was these coal pin hand guards. I got these off of Amazon and there's a few things I like about them. There's nothing really all that special. They're, they were about 40 or 50 dollars but I like how wide they are. They're very tall and they're very wide so they do a great job of protecting your hands from cold air in the winter time and also from brush and stuff like that. Installation is very simple, very similar to a lot of others. These will probably definitely not survive a rollover but they do come with these little side mirrors and those actually do come in handy so i use those whenever i'm uh, on these country roads and stuff like that <laughs> I'll talk about is these ODI lock-on grips. These are these grips are called the Rogue grips and of course they're lock-on. So you've got these little Allen screws that lock them on. So you got to cut your old grips off, slide these on over top and just tighten them down with these Allen screws. I threw a little bit of Loctite on there. They've got a little cutoff on the flange here so you can still operate your throttle no problem. And I just really like these. I've got them on my KTM 300 XCW. And I like them because they've got a good amount of like squish. They've got these large voids. So if you're in the mud, you'll maintain grip. Even if your hands get a little bit muddy. And they're just really comfortable and grippy. To me, they're, they're just a good all-around grip. And they're really cheap. If you want to get these, get them in the 120 millimeter length. Not 130. So in conclusion here, obviously I highly recommend the Grizzly 700. If you're on the fence about a smaller, like a 450, 500 size ATV versus perhaps the Grizzly 700, definitely go the 700. It's way more fun for recreational riding, but it still does all the work that the other ones do. So obviously I'm very biased, I bought one. But if you got any questions about these ATVs, please let me know, I'll do my best to answer them. Thanks.